The Living Zen Podcast is a gift from the members and associates of the Victoria Zen Center to you. If you enjoy it, please be sure to let your friends know about Living Zen. If you'd like to support our community, here are a few ways that you can do it. Download the Living Zen Podcast app for iPod, iPhone, or Android. You can also purchase additional Zen Talks by Venerable Eshu on iTunes or Amazon.com. One of the most meaningful ways to show your support is by joining our Sangha as an associate. Your commitment of $10 a month will ensure that offerings like the Living Zen Podcast and our online eZendo will continue to be available around the world to everyone with an interest in truly living Zen. To become an associate, please visit our website at www.zenwest.ca and click on the membership tab. Thank you for your support. So, um, I just returned from a (laughs) seven-day intensive practice period uh, with Choboji, which is a temple, Zen temple in Seattle. Uh, The traditional name, or the Japanese name for this kind of training period is called Seshin. Uh, Ses means uh, to gather or to collect together. And Shin means heart or mind. So it's a week-long period of practice in which we gather together the heart-mind. That's one way of understanding it. One of the things that I was deeply reminded of was the, the potency, the power of this practice. Each uh, Tuesday that we come here, we have this opportunity to uh, taste, to catch a glimpse of the power of this practice. And every time we go around the tea circle after we sit, Many, many people comment about the impact that this practice has on their lives. For many people, this Tuesday evening is the only uh, meditations and practice that they engage in in the course of of their week. And uh, during this session, many times uh, I was really struck, um, I don't know, sadness maybe is not the word, but... uh, I don't know. The feeling is, um, you know, we spend so much of our weeks, so much of our lives in a state of agitation, building up, uh, creating ideas and worries, thoughts, letting our emotions uh, lead us around being guided by our fears and our desires. And we come across this opportunity for practice once a week. And in this short period of an hour, we can feel the benefit of just entering into a strong container and allowing ourselves to stop. Just for a few minutes to just stop. We engage in a practice rather of piling up and building up and swirling around. Just this practice of undoing, being still, and allowing all of this activity to settle. Just uh, three 15-minute periods. And... Even after this, people talk about a Wednesday morning glow or it sets up my week just right. And my feeling, my experience of this is like uh, being on the surface of a great ocean, churning, broiling. And after an evening of Zen practice, we've managed to settle just the surface chop. And as we do so, we catch a glimpse. 
we catch a glimpse or we gain some kind of hint to the fact that below this chop, below this uh, turmoil, our surface thoughts and our surface emotions, there is a depth. And I think it's this hint or this suspicion or this uh, intuition of depth that keeps us coming back. For the most part in our lives, we live in the world of chop. We live in this world of rise and fall, up and down, a lot of drama. And yet we, even after a very small amount of practice, even just one evening a week, we can hear this call. We know intuitively that beyond the chop, there is this profound depth. So I'm very grateful that people come even just once a week to engage in this practice of settling the chop down a little bit. I think when we go out into our lives, having a little less chop in our day-to-day activities is of benefit to ourselves and to those who come into contact with us, uh, uh, beings animate and inanimate, both. And yet, uh, after practicing Sashin once again, I am also filled with sadness. Because what I also perceive is that same intuition that same hint of depth is something that terrifies us. That depth, that immense potential, that tremendous capacity is what we call in Buddhism our true nature. It is our true capacity, our true selves. And when we spend all of our lives living in this chop, we cut ourselves off from it, pursuing the things that we think will make us happy, chasing after the objects that we feel will satisfy us if we can only lay our hands on them, and running away from the things that we think will diminish us, harm us, make us less. Now this practice we call Zen uh, provides us with an opportunity to engage with the depth beyond chop. And this is what an activity uh, such as a session does. Just ratio, just mathematically speaking, I talk about Uh, you know, sitting once a week. And if we understand our lives and the way that we go about doing our relationships as this kind of stirring activity, which we do, what, 16, 18 hours a day, seven days a week, and then we spend one hour settling. We can understand that even if Zen practice is immensely effective, Mathematically speaking, it becomes very difficult to actually settle that agitation. So, uh, when we take up a practice of session, gathering the mind, we take seven days out of our schedule and we begin early in the morning, engaging in this practice of settling hour after hour, day after day. Every aspect of our lives is transformed from busyness into engagement. Whether we're sitting or walking, 
chanting, eating, working. Each of these activities is structured in such a way as to encourage us to uh, dissolve, to step back from this uh, activity of uh, churning and to dissolve, to dive deeply. Each of us on the surface has created, has collected these habits and preferences, choices and aversions, and we've bound them all up together into this thing that we call an I, a me, a self. And when we at once grasp the immensity of the depths, this thing that we call a self, this collection of uh, hopes and fears, preferences and aversions, we can see it to be something quite small. This bundle of uh, choices, habits, that we create and we call a self, we can see is a container of our own creation, a limitation of our own creation, bondage of our own creation. What our practice offers us is an opportunity to step outside of our so-called self, When we look at a flower, we are a person, a human being, looking at an object, a flower. This is uh, the universe itself reflecting upon itself. In truth, it's just one thing. But we create these separations in our mind and hold on to them. I am looking at a flower. And more and more, our world around us is affirming what I'm saying. Science tells us that this cosmos is not made of separate things, but of one unblemished fabric. This is not just some abstract thought. This is not just some interesting concept. But in our practice, in our lives, this is something that we ourselves can experience. And it's important. As we walk around convinced that I'm just this little thing cut off from all of the rest of this universe, how can I not want more? How can I not see all the many things that I am not and feel inadequate and feel in need? How can I not look around me and see all of these things that are bigger and stronger and be afraid? How can I not look around me and see these infinite beings and being separate from them feel so utterly alone? This practice is difficult. The very form itself is aimed at pressing us into our corners. The structure of this practice has been cleverly designed by generation after generation of teachers, adepts, in doing this practice to press us into our preferences, to drive us into the things that scare us and to hold us there. So that breathing, sitting up straight, 
We don't have the opportunity to chase. We don't have the opportunity to run away. The only thing that we have the opportunity, the ability to do, is to open ourselves, to embrace the things that scare us, and to dissolve into the things that we think we do not possess and find that fundamentally we are one. And again, this is not some conceptual idea, some philosophical uh, hypothesis, but an experienceable act. Cut! In Rinzai Zen, we engage in this practice which pulls us, which breaks us up, which drives us out of this calcification that we call I. We work with a teacher, and in the Rinzai tradition we use a practice called koans, which systematically break up the places that we hold on to. These aspects of self that we take as real, that hold us apart from this universe we are already awash in. This infinite capacity, this unhindered liberation is our true nature. And this practice, every moment of our lives, is a gateway simple door to our realization, to our awakening to who we truly are. So why do I go and engage in this week-long of practice, hours of sitting, getting a sore back, sore knees, being pressed into things that scare me, having to face the desires that arise in my mind, pushed to the limit and held at the limit for a whole week. Why? Because over and over and over again, this limit falls away. And I find myself immersed in this wondrous cosmos, not separate from it, not apart from it, but intimately connected, indistinguishably unified. And this experience, this experience of unification, we arise from transformed. That me that I held on to so dearly before can't stay. It has to move. The things that I thought were so desperately needed, I can realize are already a part of me. The things that I despise and fear, I can know are also just a part of me. the self arises again. I, as a separate being, look at a flower. And I can appreciate me. And I can appreciate the flower. But I'm no longer fooled into thinking that we're fundamentally separate. I recognize that myself and flower arise from one origin. We have one home. We share one mother. A monk, uh, how long, what time is it? I've been yammering on and on here. Okay. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, what we call a priest here or a monk, the Japanese term is unsui. Un means cloud, and sui means water. 
So the traditional term for a monk is cloud water. And this points to the practice that we engage in, like a cloud not being obstructed by obstacles, completely flowing, not uh, fixating, becoming solid, calcified. And water, which uh, transforms or takes the shape of the vessel into which it is poured. This name, Unsui, is just a reminder of the practice that we all engage in, not just monks, but to recognize that our nature is not solid, but is fundamentally fluid. Our practice uh, when we sit, when we chant, is to remember this, not to be this object engaging in an activity, but to simply dissolve, to become one with that object that we're using, to become one with that activity that we're doing, to become one with that other to whom we are relating. Uh, And we can do this every day, not just once a week, not just in formal practice, but this is an opportunity that we can take in each and every moment of our lives. Uh, Thank you for your patience. Thanks for listening to the Living Zen Podcast. If you follow Living Zen through iTunes, I would very much appreciate it if you would take a moment to let me know what you think about it by rating or reviewing the podcast so that new listeners can also hear what you have to say. Thank you for your time and for your support.